Hey guys, welcome back. VDC Care here. We're back with Season 9, Episode 42 of our weekly Q&A content. It's a YouTube video and a podcast. Both of those are available in places. You're on one of them right now. Uh, good luck finding the other one if you're here. Uh, I'm sure you Well, can... it's in the description. Well, that you kind of gave the whole <laughs> game away, man. That was the... That was their job. Anyways, you wanted to start out by talking about what we're looking at if you're on the video. Right. Okay. So in line with the last few months, I guess, of trying to make the gameplay underlying the Q&As relevant to the current week, we've got Bounty Hunter Lobo. Mm -hmm. Bounty Hunter Lobo is the challenge for this week. And if this Q&A lasts long enough, we're going to be demonstrating two different teams. One is the more recent one with Batgirl, and one is the one from previously, which was pretty effective, was Red Lantern, Hell Jordan. And the reason why I wanted to talk about both of them is one of the, the common, the really common questions we get about multiplayer videos is, well, what if I don't have whatever character? Who can I use instead? And the reason why this question is so difficult is really well demonstrated this. So with the Batgirl team, because she's giving Lobo an extra bar of power, you're seeing a loadout of Bounty Hunter Lobo that prioritizes maxing out damage. So he's got Tantu Totem, but not Master's Death Card, and he's got two gears that will increase his damage. One is the Quake Engine, so that it'll increase the special damage by 50%, but also extend his damage over time that locks the opponent in so they can't tag out. Mm. And then we've also got the uh, Demon Blade, which is the only gear, even though it's a two and a half star gear, it's the only gear that will both increase the crit chance on special two, but also boost crit or special two damage. Mm. So Batgirl herself has enough sort of, uh, has a good gear loadout so that she could be a secondary damage dealer if Bounty Hunter Lobo was ever in trouble. Now, with the Red Lantern Hal Jordan team, oh, and Hawk Girl has uh, Astro Harness, and she's sort of, um, you can do whatever you want with her, but she's going to tank it a little bit, and we're not really needing her to be offensive at all. Mm. With the Red Lantern, so let's say you don't have Batgirl. If you use Red Lantern Hal Jordan instead, Lobo needs to have both Tantu Totem Master's Death Card. Because Red Lantern Harold Jordan has three bars of power, he can get away with starting immediately with a special. So his gear loadout is to strip all the gears of the opponent with Claw of Horus and the uh, Enchantress. But he needs Astro Harness so that he can do two special ones before he starts losing health. Mm -hmm. So really at no health cost to him. Which means Hawkgirl now can't have Astro Harness like she does on the team with Batgirl. So the, that, that interplay, right? There's a cascading effect as you need to make a compromise in one area to optimize another, and those shift around when you have to swap out one character or another. Yeah, everything's so, always a trade-off. Everything's always a trade-off. So there's no two characters that are exactly the same so that you can just pull one out and put them in. Like Most of the time we're doing something with a specific intent in mind, whether it's to take advantage of a passive, whether it's to take advantage of the behavior of a special two or the speed of their basics mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah. And you can, you know, take out somebody and put somebody else in that has the same sort of overarching title or designation. There's this right. they're a special specialist, right? right they're a basic right. damage dealer. Right. But the specifics will change a lot. And our sort of thing is we played this long enough that the specifics are often what we're actually picking for. Right. right. Instead of sort of the more general principles. And you can see how it's it's actually way better with Redland Her Hal Jordan. Maybe not in the speed. But in terms of predictability, because what you're doing is you just bring them in, you're stripping off all gears if you need to. And if not, you just drop in Bounty Hunter Lobo. You need to, because of the way we've loaded him out with Red Lantern Harold Jordan, he still needs a couple of uh, swipes. And what that does is gives him the, closes the distance. Actually, in both cases, you need to do the swipes because with, even though you've got two bars automatically with Batgirl, mm -hmm. if you drop in and you do the special two right away, Master's... Oh, actually, you don't need to because without Master's Death Cart, right? You, there's no shoving. So it's just an interesting way that you, you, you play it differently because of how it goes. But the problem is then, instead of worrying about the first one missing, you have to worry about are you timing it right so that the opponent doesn't block. Mm -hmm. So there we go. Yeah. So our first comment 
of the week is from a very uh, special commenter, right. which was the subject of much of last week's sort of video. Right. It's MG425 on YouTube. Right. Uh, and so their comment is, thanks a lot for sharing my findings and thank you so much for the kind words. Uh, and that's very funny because I think this is one of the first times you're on the other side of that comment. There's often people saying nice stuff about us where we right. have to go, oh, thank you so much, whatever. Right. Um, and it, it, for this you know, YouTube channel, at least. It's very right. rarely in the other direction, right. but I'm glad. I linked more of my guides at the bottom of my study. If you want to read something even closer to a scientific research paper about the game, you can take a look at the one titled Survivor Wheel Mechanics. I'll paste the TLDR, which is too long, didn't read, of my battle rating study here for others to reference. Matchmaking and battle rating gain depend on a number called team power. For almost any team, you can calculate its team power by first adding health plus damage for each of your characters, then, take 60% of the largest number, 30% of the middle number, and 10% of the smallest number, and add these together to get team power. Mm. The threshold for 5,000 battle rating matches is 120,000 team power. Build a team with 120,000 power or higher to get maximum battle rating for all of your ladders. Based on my iOS data, I'd recommend building teams with about 1,100... Sorry, 112,500 team power. Although any strong teams geared well between 110,000 and 125,000 power should work fine for fast battle rating gain. Make sure to avoid buying Health Alliance credit support cards to maximize the damage output your team can have. Mm -hmm. And so that's cool. That's, you know, sort of pretty thorough. We're, we're going to talk a little bit more about it, but maybe let's bring in the next comment too, which is also about sort of the same findings, unless you have mm -hmm. anything specific right guess... now. A sort of meta comment, I guess. It's it's interesting how the as the community that plays has sort of constricted a little bit, right? Like this is clearly not the peak in justice time. There's probably a lot fewer players, and if I, when I say a lot, I mean probably mm -hmm. there used to be like an order of magnitude more players. Yeah, that it's it's actually a more more interesting community now in some ways because the people who contribute are less you get less of the hacking and cheating and more the people who are or maybe it's easier to hear the voices of those who are um playing a little bit more thoughtfully mm -hmm. like the fact that we've had this insight into the game so many years mm -hmm. after this feature rolled out is is a testament to the people who are still playing yeah because the people who are playing now care more about it and they have right. to you know, or have cared about it for longer at the very least. They've had a right. more enduring interest in it. You know, when we were at sort of our peak channel popularity with the glitches and stuff, we get like dozens of comments just saying this right. doesn't work. Right. Uh, and then most of them, you know, either wouldn't reply or if we ended up having a back and forth with them at all, would just go, right. oh, I did something wrong. It works now. Right. Um. And so like the majority of the comments were from people who had a lot sort of and that's not a bad thing right it's not a bad thing for those kind of people to play the game uh and you know any game that has a like, community being so important uh needs you know a bunch of people playing something casually right but now the comments that we get are a lot fewer in number but the there are massively a higher percentage of them are thoughtful right. and involved right. and you know stuff like from people who have been playing this game for a very long time right yeah right so uh, the next comment comes from Cameron 107, which was who actually brought this to our attention initially right. uh, and stopped us from losing out on seeing it. And they said, MG's post had been in the back of my mind since it came out, but I didn't bring it up earlier because I was a little skeptical at first. It was hard to believe that something this revolutionary would be discovered this late in the lifespan of the game. And we sort of replied, do you want to talk about yeah, so just read I, your reply? So I forgot to mention in the video that we tested it characters with and without passive stat boost swapping them in and out of teams at the threshold of battle point groupings and the results held up so mm -hmm. that was that was important because i i got carried away last week just gushing about it yeah but the reason why i gush about it isn't that i just take it at face value it's like all the other glitches that i'm way back when when there were more glitches to exploit it was from testing you have replicated the results right so this is the scientific method the right? model works yeah, the key for why, and so the last part of that my comment was the key for why it was discovered so late is how difficult it would be to do any of the work without the six three one ratio because mm -hmm. that is the initial calculation, and then you're basing any kind of um, research like just trying to figure out which numbers do what at what level. Mm -hmm. You need to have that ratio correct before you can do anything else. So you could spend a bunch of time just accumulating numbers without that understanding. It's just 
garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. So that was key to any kind of research or study. Because if you think it's going to be, um, what, 0.33, 0.33, 0.33, then you're going to get, you're going to be making bad assumptions and you're going to be getting bad numbers too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then Cameron replied saying, yeah, that's true. They did mention that it took them over two years to figure out the exact formula. I've been thinking quite a bit about how all this will impact our perception of certain characters as well as the meta as a whole. If Injustice 2 Superman's 50% damage slash health gain, health gain, um, and Arkham Origins Deathstroke's 80% damage gain are completely ignored by the matchmaker, then surely those two are among the best characters for multiplayer now. A large chunk of the community is already playing unbalanced teams, and cards like these would make fights even easier. If it wasn't for their rarity slash inaccessibility, I would imagine we would see Superman and Deathstroke everywhere on the online ladder. Right. So I'll tell you what, I'll suggest in the last little bit in terms of what this would potentially mean as the, the information gets disseminated. Mm -hmm. I think in Justice 2 Superman, we already see him a lot. Yeah. I think people already take for granted at least that when you've got him, he's really good. Maybe Arkham Knight Batman, I think those are the two best individual characters when you ignore like the rest of the team. Mm -hmm. um, now, the interesting thing is about is Deathstroke. So maybe Deathstroke. The problem is when we see him in teams, he's not that much more difficult to fight and when we've used him on our teams outside of some very specific groupings like i think there's that that pack that was um arkham harley quinn arkham origins batman and arkham origins deathstroke yeah which is one of the few pack packs it's actually a really good team um the i think there's other teams that have a lot more synergy that can boost damage output even more than arkham origins deathstroke's passive so i think in an arkham team i think arkham origins deathstroke is definitely very interesting yeah. Because you start off with Arkham Knight Batgirl and Arkham Origins Deathstroke. The problem, I think, with Arkham Origins Deathstroke is there's not a way to leverage his damage the same, say, with Luther Bane or Batgirl, where with the right gears and sometimes like Flashpoint with the right teammates, you can boost their damage so much that it's way better mm -hmm. than any kind of passive. I guess the other thing that you have to keep in mind too then is that if you're using gears that boost damage, you're boosting the original base stat and not the boosted stat. Mm. So the the flip side is that some of the gears don't give you as much of an advantage on characters that have boosted their damage already with the passive. Proportionally. Right, yeah. right. And th I guess that's, that's the other issue with Deathstroke more so than Superman because he came in a lot earlier in the life cycle of the game, his base stats are okay, but they're not, you know, that they, they, they don't take into account or they're not affected by the power creep that you see mm -hmm. with uh, the later uh, challenge and um, multiplayer characters. Mm -hmm. So there we go. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's so, a good point. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's interesting too, right? Because there's the whole having somebody in as an offensive team versus putting someone in to leave up for fights right. as your sort of defensive team. And I think, I don't know about other people, but I think, you know, as the battle point threshold has changed, I guess if you're really trying to optimize and maximize the points you get, you want to put in the best defensive team. But for us, at least, the team that's in that other people are fighting is the same as our offensive team because it doesn't right. make sense to put that extra time into sort of leaving somebody in. Right. And so there's a very different sort of math that goes on in your head for what would be annoying to fight versus what you want to play yourself because a lot of times you know you mm -hmm. the the teams that do best are the ones that have a, the biggest disparity in terms of how you play them versus how an ai would play them right right because right? you have a team that you construct and then you exploit really strongly their specific advantages and weaknesses right. Right, whereas the AI kind of just plays them out normally. Yeah. And so it's interesting because, you know, the best team for defense uh, would be a team that attracts the most people and wins the highest percentage of the time once it attracts those fights. And so when you say something like, you know, you, we're going to see them like everywhere, right? Yeah. Uh, in the online ladder. I guess the, the question is see everywhere as in everyone's going to play them for offense or see everywhere as in that's going to be the main defense team too. Because I think ultimately the teams that you end up seeing on defense are less of a reflection of how popular they are, how many teams there are there, and more a reflection of which people match up well 
based off of sort of the mm-hmm. internal calculation that the game is doing mm-hmm. to give you in fights. Right. And so, you know, there's that sort of in between that middle range where there's a huge amount of variety because there's a lot of people with the same stats, right? Mm. But you can see sort of clusters yeah. of more similar people towards the top of the stat pool. Yeah. And so I guess one of the reasons why this is a good sort of realization uh, mm-hmm. and knowing sort of what range you want to hit in terms of your power to hit that minimum threshold for 5,000 battle points is if that's the team that turn out to be the most efficient, which it, the numbers look like they are, right? You know, right. you can do your own testing. That's also a range where you have a lot of variety in who you face. So I think the cool thing about that is even if it changes the meta for what people are playing, if everybody's playing in that sort of stat range, it means that there's a huge amount of variety in the matchups that you're getting, the mm-hmm. people that you're going up against. So you have faster fights on average, but you also have, on average, a lot more sort of variety than you would if you're just playing with like the absolute high stack guys right so i think right. it's good for a couple of reasons right so e- even if the meta does shift um your actual playing variety will s- probably still be pretty broad right because and if people actually take advantage of the information properly and don't look at just one aspect of it you're gonna have this n- big grouping of yeah. real players in that stat range instead of desperately trying to um you know sometimes when you do a ladder yeah twice and you're facing a bunch of the same guys over yeah. and over again. It's yeah, it's pretty boring. boring. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, one of the things that you we've done a lot is you set up teams that can like, deal with all the different types of people you face. Right. And when you're grinding, you want somebody who can do the exact same thing and it'll work on every type of team. Right. But when you're actually trying to play, what you want to do is have a team that can win consistently and hopefully mm-hmm. win pretty fast, but that you have to swap it up a little bit. And you're not just, you know, mindlessly repeating the exact same right. thing over and over again. Right. And so this is, you know, something that's kind of good for that. If you got more team variety, hopefully you will, you know, to, yeah. to get the fastest fights, have to switch up your strategy and change how you play. That, that's a good point, right? Because it's uh, there's two aspects of the game. We, we've always broken it down to this. And once you get away from the, the just collecting part and you're starting to play for the, the sandbag, the sandbox is yeah. that the sandbox part mm-hmm. it's actually more interesting because when you're just if you there's some people who want to do it mindlessly they just want to get stuff yeah and they're putting their time and if you're playing like that and you're accumulating stuff i gotta tell you it's frustrating because there's just so much to accumulate and if you're not enjoying it while you're doing it then it, that's a good way to burn out and never really get to where you need to because mm. literally it'll take a couple of years to get even the Valorium alloy that you need mm-hmm. to max out, say, the metal characters. So I actually, I'm thinking about it now. I had a conversation recently about sort of having fun. Yeah. And it seems like we have that conversation a lot, right? And we're, yes. we're, we're here right now where it's like, what's the most fun, right? What's the most enjoyable? And we're saying that the collecting part, uh, in our opinion, for us, certainly, we can say it wasn't the most enjoyable part. Right. And we think for a lot of people, it's probably not the most enjoyable part. And so the conversation I had recently was about sort of group activities you can do, and especially group activities where there's a winner and a loser. Mm. And so um, I was talking about, because I, uh, anyways, you know, picking, picking things to do with people and there's sort of collaborative stuff. There's collaborative like video games that you can play like Valorant or whatever. Right. Uh, but I was talking about Jackbox games and why I like them so much and compared to something that feels very similar. So Jackbox games for anybody who doesn't know um, are these collection of party games and you sort of buy them in a pack and then one device runs them and hosts it and then everybody else gets on their own device and uses it as a controller so it's most often your phone you're like you know maybe typing in responses to prompts or drawing something or whatever else and a game that bears a striking similarity to that is kahoot and so if you don't know kahoot Mm -hmm. um that's just sort of like a quiz game and it's used a lot in schools um but it can also be used sort of if you want to like make a quiz for your like friends or whatever else uh and you it's the same thing one person hosts it Mm -hmm. everybody else joins on the device Mm -hmm. and there's a different types of quiz questions so there's true or false ones it's like select the right one out of four options Mm -hmm. like rank the order uh that kind of thing if you you know in our the thing that you would know from is you know how in our movie theaters and like cineplexes they sometimes have those like games right kind of like that okay and so what I was saying is why I like Jackbox so much. And I think Jackbox is, in my opinion, a lot more collaborative and less competitive is specifically how they approach fun. So 
both both of those things can be fun and i think if you have the right group and if you have like the right you know questions if it's operating at sort of the right level for the people you're with it can be enjoyable Mm -hmm. but with kahoot the goal is to win right and you're answering these questions and you get rewarded for answering correctly and you get rewarded for answering faster and the thing is it's not more fun for somebody else to be doing better than you your goal is to win and other people's performance uh you know, you want people to maybe be competing with you. You want it to be close, right? You don't want to run away right. with it. But outside of that sort of range where everybody's at a similar skill level, it's not more or less fun if somebody else is doing better or worse than you. And the vast majority of the other people, uh, you know, because unless everybody's right at the same level, if somebody's lagging behind, that person is not mm-hmm. sort of impacting your experience at all. Right. But with Jackbox, even the games that are strictly competitive i'm talking about something like quiplash right uh where you're trying to tell jokes and then everybody votes on their favorite most of the other games are about creating communal enjoyment and the points are awarded based off of who's making the coolest or best or most entertaining thing right so the worse you're doing the more entertaining everybody else's stuff is right so the person who's getting the least points is theoretically the person who's being the most entertained by everybody else right and so there's a sort of balance where other people doing better actually makes you have more fun if if it's right. if the voting system is working as intended See, I, I, and i don't know, know i you put it in a way that i hadn't actually thought of in my mind the way i'd sort of conceptualized it was that jackbox is less of a game that's on rails where you have a an expected outcome mm-hmm. and it's de- determined by very specific responses. Yeah. Whereas Jack in the Box is in a lot of ways is so open-ended that it's open you to Jackbox. Jackbox, what did yeah. I say? Jack in the Box. Jack in the Box. Yeah. All right, so the, the it allows the creativity to, so that the person who is potentially even if you're w- winning or not winning that element of creativity mm-hmm. and openness where you get to be surprised mm-hmm. by something that's not just entertainment, joyful. Mm-hmm. I think that's what what I love about it, right? Like, I don't even need to be competitive. I, mm-hmm. I mean, there's a joy in winning games sometimes. Yeah. But the fact that there's these, these moments that can happen, mm-hmm. totally unexpected, unscripted, I, I love that. Yeah. And so I think it's about sort of that, like, primary versus secondary goal setting where in a game in a lot of games there's a sort of primary goal of winning and that is the main goal clearly and the there's the secondary goals are less clear and in a game like kahoot you know there's not really a clear secondary goal it's like winning you're getting the most points and then like the secondary goal would also be maybe like demonstrating your knowledge which is the same you know leads to the same outcome of winning right right and they sort of all funnel down at this point and then there's maybe like the tertiary goal of like having fun right enjoying something with friends it's supposed to be entertaining and that's you know why you're doing kahoot instead of something else but the the primary goal if you were to lay it out that way is pretty clearly just being the best right and in in games like jackbox the primary goal is nominally getting the most points right 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 but the actual way that you do that the sort of gameplay loop what behavior that encourages is being the most entertaining or making sort of like the strongest like connections with people there's like you know uh what is it fibbage three enough about you where the way that you earn points is by successfully tricking your friends into like your fake fact about your other friends right and so you're learning about people at the same time as you're trying to sort of prove how well you know them by believably writing an answer as right, them right. and stuff like that and so and i think about all the most memorable times i've had playing jackbox and i haven't done nearly as much kahoot but you know when i think about kahoot it's like oh it's the time that i won and that it was really close or whatever and the times of jackbox uh are very rarely at all related to the points i got right a lot of my favorite memories of that are moments that happened that were communal experiences of fun and most of them were not when mm-hmm. I had the best answer. Right. It was when somebody else had the best answer uh, right. or, you know, an answer or a question or a prompt or right. something it, yeah. had us have like a good time. I, I if, if anything, it's almost never anything that I did because I can't surprise myself. Yeah. But when somebody else surprises me, that sometimes th- that's spectacular. Like, yeah. The, yeah. So like one thing for Jackbox, there's a game called Bracketeering where uh, you have to like input answers 
And so the the prompt was, uh, what is your favorite thing to juggle? Or it's like, what's the coolest thing to juggle? And a bunch of people were giving really sort of like straight and narrow like answers. It was like, you know, uh, bowling pins that are on fire or whatever, like chainsaws right. or Chainsaws, whatever. Right. And then right. one person, and I have no clue up to this one to do this, wrote miserable grandma. <laughs> <laughs> and there was something so just absurd about it yeah. and it, it doesn't translate as well obviously to just me retelling it but there's something really just fully bizarre about it that we were all like losing like like laughing so hard and right. so like those those cool moments and i like i don't i don't even remember what my answer was at all uh right. but you remember that one and that's just like sort yeah. of the most recent one that comes yeah. to mind but so those are moments like that that are just so much better than winning and so that's i think in a lot of ways when we try to talk about you know having fun and what's best yeah. to do an injustice where the i think it's so clear when you start playing that the primary gameplay loop the primary cycle your primary objective is to collect stuff mm -hmm. the only sort of other objective is to you know get through the missions right and beat right. all of them right but that doesn't last nearly as long as the collecting does and it's kind of it, it's the same thing where you talk about how in uh, Kahoot, how, you know, demonstrating knowledge and trying to win both fundamentally are the same action yeah. and have the same result, where beating the single player campaign is 100% a collecting thing. Right. You just need more copies and better stats, and it's entirely based off of stats and almost non it's you need a minimal amount of skill and skill will make it easier for you right. but the stats matter so much more because of the way that the game just right the way power accumulates you. even it literally is an equalizer so that it limits your ability to win unless you are a comparable spat because you get more power by being hit yeah. so the more damage you take the more you're losing the fight the more power you get which balances the fight out mm -hmm. and the flip side is true too and it's only multiplayer mm -hmm. that that sort of calculation changes yeah so it's it strikes me that for injustice just for how i was talking about like jackbox versus games like kahoot the primary goal that they set for you what seems like the primary objective of it is not the most fun thing and you know even the most fun thing kind of requires you to collect stuff first you need right. to hit a certain critical mass so right. it's just it's just interesting. I don't know if I have a point exactly, uh, but it's it's interesting. And I think it's always worth, especially when you're looking at what you are doing in your free time, being a little bit intentional and making sure you are seeking the fun. And when you say intentional, I in my mind, I, I'm thinking something like mindful, like that you're yeah. t taking a step back and, and thinking a little bit about what it is that you're enjoying and what makes it enjoyable and what other things you could be doing at the same time. Like mm -hmm. that kind of mindfulness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Okay. So there we go. That was about Deathstroke. <laughs> and Justice of Superman. Nice. So next comment comes from Killa Knight. I'm not sure. It's K-I-L-A and then N-I-G-H-T. And they say, this doesn't have to do with this week's news, but why do you guys always use specials even when the opponent has invincibility? And then Cameron107 said, presumably it's to prevent their opponents from getting a special or basic combo off. And it's not like there's any real downside to spamming specials if you have Tantu Todium. And then uh, Tenshukaku, uh, T-N-S-H-U-K-A-K-U says, with the right gear, you can reset your power against invulnerable opponents and it stops the enemies from using specials so sort of two answers that are are similar kind of different rephrasing just focusing on a little bit of different sort of nuances of it it's like the that parable about the blind men and the elephant mm. and the, the, so there's elements of it i think that's true so let me break it down so uh when uh tenshu kaku is talking about the right gear really the only gear you're talking about is tantu totem yeah right tantu totem lets you get your power back if your special doesn't do any damage mm -hmm. and that's and all right, so and Cameron said um, that to prevent the opponent from getting a special basic combo off, and no downside to spamming specials if you have Tanty Totem. All right, so here's yeah. the thing: definitely the strategy is if we don't, if we're not invulnerable, it is a way to avoid taking damage. Yeah, you basically get temporary invulnerability for the duration of your special. Right, and the cost is zero when you have Tanty Totem. Right. The problem is, it's not, there is a potential downside because, and, and the perfect illustration of this is static, where mm -hmm. static's special one 
takes a bit of time, so it's good it kills the duration of the invulnerability, but it's multiple hits. Yeah. And every single attack that is not blocked by your opponent, whether they actually take damage or not, so if they're invulnerable from the Tantu Totem, and you're static, and you do a special one, and you do a bunch of hits, and they're not blocking, they will generate power as if they were being hit. Mm -hmm. And we know that in multiplayer even, if you're hit by a basic, you don't generate a lot of power. If you're hit by a special, each hit does a decent amount of power. Mm -hmm. So the problem with static is that if you do a special one, they do not block, they have Astral Hearts and Vulnerability, you're giving them a bunch of power. So that when you finish your special, there's like a... a I keep on calling it refractory period. You had another word for it before you can do another special. Like there's a pause where there's a, like a little moment in time mm -hmm. where they can do a special on you before you can do a, another special again. I don't remember. Okay. So the specific team that we have is uh, Rebirth Raven. And it's literally, she is literally the best complement to Static for this reason because she can steal the power back that you've given to the opponent by doing a special and if you don't do that static is very vulnerable mm -hmm. so there is a downside now the best way to finish with a sort of deal with invulnerability and you're doing a special is by if you've got a character that doesn't do a lot of hits like maybe one or two hit special mm -hmm. and then it doesn't generate a lot of power so it's interesting because it's sort of it's definitely true we don't want to get hit that's the principle but you've still got to manage the even though it feels mm -hmm. it doesn't cost you as much before Tantu Totem, if you did it during the invulnerability, you just lose your power, you get nothing to show for it, and you just kill some time, which is sometimes not worth it for the power. But there is a potential downside, and you the more effective your team is, the better you manage that from yeah. hurting your game. Yeah, did you have anything else you wanted to say about that? Uh, I am not. Sure. I think the, the other potential disadvantage is if the invulnerability drops partway through, right? So you, you only, don't get full value. Yeah, you only get sort of your refunded power if you deal no damage. So right. if partway through, if there's like one or two hits right at the end, and that's like sort of the worst case scenario, right. Right. Uh, where you dink them, yep. once their shields goes down any damage you do means that you're not going to sort of get your value out of that right. special because you're going to lose most of the damage and you're not going to get your power back so the other thing about that is that you kind of need to time it out right and that's where sort of experience with the characters and knowing like i can get two specials off and then uh, after ah, those yeah. two specials i just have to block because right. if i try a third one it won't work uh becomes really your best friend or maybe switching from special two to special one. Yeah. So this is per actually you you you've you've brought up a really interesting point too. Sometimes there's a huge advantage in doing that. So if you've got Claw of Horus, mm -hmm. do special one over and over during invulnerability, you are you have a really good chance of stripping them all the gear. So once the invulnerability is done, they have nothing left. The other way that we've gotten into the habit of this is with New Fifty Two Wonder Woman, where because her passive gives her Justice League teammates power every time half of what she spends. So it's a huge advantage. And that's where the counting matters because I know that with New 52 Wonder Woman against a fully fused and maxed out Astro Harness, I can yeah. get three special ones during her, uh, during one invulnerability because yeah. she's that fast. Which is one and a half bars of power to the rest right. of your team. And if I can get the opponent from the first invulnerability to the next invulnerability using only one bar of power yeah. and I get another invulnerability, I can fully charge up both my teammates with three bars of power when they tag in. Yeah. Just for the cost of only one. one special. Right. Against that one opponent. Yeah. Yeah. So it's definitely, um, there's definitely, it, it's one of those things where the more you play it, the more you get a, a sense of what you can get out of it. It's not really as simple as, as it might look. Mm -hmm. Even, I guess this is sort of the, the next level of the answer to the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There we go. Do you want to do one more? Does this feel like a great time? I think this is a good spot to end. Okay. Yeah. So to finish up, I'd like to give a shout out to Eliza Dubstep Caton. She goes, wah, 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 wah
Um, what? It's I just that's just random dubstep mouth noises. All right, what? So I've seen videos where it's dubstep, like it's yeah. the, that dancing, right? But what is that? What like, do you what mean? Do you, like the, that dancing? The, there's there's like there's the I can't even remember who the guy is that does this thing, and it's called the the title of it is dubstep. Isn't that not what it is? What's dubstep? Dubstep is just like a specific subgenre of like electronic music that focuses heavily on like. I don't see. I don't even know the exact definition of dubstep. Skrillex. It's like older. It's an older type of like electronic music, maybe like house electronic music. Oh, um, so- and it just focuses on like these really sort of fast rhythms and loud noises, and they're. It's kind of much maligned and joked about because it has a very sort of like early internet vibe to it, and I think a lot of people are sort of considered embarrassing. Okay, so I just I I did not know that. I honestly like because I'd only ever seen it in the context of YouTube videos. Yeah. It was always dancing. So I thought dubstep music was a specific type of dance, like break dancing or something, like a, a subtype of break dancing. No, like beatboxing or whatever. I don't know. Beatboxing is the one where you make the noise with your yeah. mouth. But that's beatbox that's not So okay, that's interesting. So you just you are only learning for the first time now what dubstep is. Yeah. Okay. This is this is wild that's very strange yeah 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 okay uh <laughs> yeah this channel was brought to you by nothing in particular i just decided it would be kind of funny to make some dubstep noises with okay. my mouth all right this. yeah and we, we we learned something i learned something along yeah. the way okay yeah. we'll have to figure out what dubstep technically actually means <laughs> i'm sure somebody in the in our audience will be happy to tell us though yeah um, we'd also like to give a thank you to our lovely supporters on Patreon. That would be Bombo Ben, Consul Peasant, and Ed Woon, supporting us to the highest tier, Last Word. Cinemac and Mohammed Al Shade at your message here tier. Sean Farrell, Daniel Simonson, Aaron Mall, Michael DeVries, Brandon C., Irvin Ruiz, Eddie Du, and Hoshi127, supporting us at the credited level. And Chris Wolf, Scarlet Danny, Awesome Gamer 2 for 1, Pavu RS, Gavin Malat, and Isra E at the gratitude level. I just want to say before we get any further too, at some point, we're getting closer. We're not quite there yet. We made a promise to our supporters that if you supported us at any point during the last few years during the pandemic, even when you had to take a step back, we would keep leaving you the credits. And part of that was because we were still so grateful for any kind of support during what was a really difficult time. Yeah, we didn't want anybody to feel penalized for ha- suddenly having a different financial situation because right. a lot of people did. Right, but the other part was that it, w- it, it it appealed to my sense of laziness where I wouldn't have to change the mm-hmm. the visual credits at the end. But I feel like that at some point we've got to be moving out, out of this area. And one thing I hadn't anticipated when we made this decision originally to just only add people to the credits mm-hmm. and not take anybody away was it's going to look... This pandemic looks very different for d- people around the world. Mm-hmm. And that it reminds me of um, this. I'm going to get this quote wrong from William Gibson, where we are living in the future already. It's just. Um, it's like unequally distributed. In- equally, yeah, unequally distributed. And it, it put me in mind of that again. I mean, peripheral, great show based on William Gibson mm-hmm. book. Um, so I feel like it seemed like such an easy decision at the time to say, hey, we're still going to do this until the pandemic is over and it's quite possible that the pandemic won't be over for some people for a very long time yeah and it's it would be easy to have a really sort of north american centric view of things Mm -hmm. um, because i feel like we're getting close to the point where it's no longer a pandemic but it's an endemic infection but the news that we're seeing out of china is clearly different Right. Yeah. So I don't know. It's just I. I thought I'd at least bring this up because we've been doing this for so long. And we'll we have to think things. about it. We might have to make a change. To, not have to, but we might be making a change soon potentially. Yeah. This is yeah. your. This is your advance warning. Yeah. It's been. Uh, it's been a while. It's been a while. In a few months, it's going to be three years. Yeah. So, anyways, thank you so much for your support, and thanks so much to all of you for watching. We'll see you next time. Komoda. Komoda.